ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਆ ਵੁਡ ਲਾਈਕ ਟੂ ਫਰਸਟ ਆਫ ਆਲ ਥੈਂਕ ਆਲ ਆਫ ਯੂ ਫੋਰ ਬੀਇੰਗ ਹੇਅਰ ਟੂ ਅਟੈਂਡ ਥਿਸ ਪ੍ਰੈਜੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਐਂਡ ਐਟ ਦ ਸੇਮ ਟਾਈਮ ਆ ਵੁਡ ਆਲਸੋ ਲਾਈਕ ਟੂ ਥੈਂਕ ਆਲ ਆਰ ਸਿੱਖ ਬ੍ਰਦਰਸ ਐਂਡ ਸਿਸਟਰਸ ਹੂ ਆਰ ਸਟਿਲ ਫਾਈਟਿੰਗ ਫੋਰ ਜਸਟਿਸ ਆਫਟਰ 38 ਇਅਰਸ ਆਫ ਵਾਟ ਹੈਪਨ ਇਨ 1984 ਓ ਐਸ ਵੀ ਆਲ ਨੋ ਏਵਰੀ ਇਅਰ ਵੀ ਡੂ ਇਵੈਂਟਸ at city hall or at our state capital in connecticut but this year we chose to use the platform called sick heart gallery and we put up a nice exhibition this year to educate folks about who we are where we are from and what happened to us in 1984 and why it is important for this world to recognize that killings of six as a genocide while after over 30 years now we have all the documentation and uh, uh, people who are educated enough they look at the documentation and they have recognized those uh, mass killings of six as genocide in many states of united states as well connecticut is uh, one of the state which has uh, made a remarkable accomplishment to recognize the pain of sick nation and uh, they have recognized in 2018 in their legislation uh, to commemorate November 1st every year as a Sikh genocide remembrance day under the leadership of governor Malloy and even after that uh, i will also like to acknowledge all this was done with the hard work and advocacy of uh, our state senator Kathy Austin who fights for all the citizens living in this area every day uh also i would like to uh, let you know that in 2019 our new governor governor ned lemont have also recognized pain of sikh nation and condemned the killing of six that happened in june of 1984 at sikh vatican or sikh spiritual center darbar sahib and sikh political center rakal takhat sahib so these are very big accomplishment for sikh community that uh, we have came to that level that now the understanding is not just limited to sikh community but it's also fr- freely flowing to the highest levels of the countries there where we chose to live and we call it our home so i hope uh, all these efforts uh, by uh, various organizations are helpful to provide closure to the sikh community overall all over the world and at the same time it also gives them uh, a spirit and sense of security that the country or the place where they chose now to live in after 1984 sikh genocide they are safe in this place so i hope uh, this advocacy and uh, this work, work work will continue and i applaud all the efforts of everyone who is doing anything for the sikh community worldwide there are many accomplishments sikhs have made in australia in canada in uh, london uh, so you know we need to make sure we continue with our educational efforts overall so part of the thing that we are here today is uh, get a little more education and uh, what sikh genocide was about and how it happened what events triggered that uh, so we will have a small presentation on it and then uh, we will be able to uh, set up this room and uh, go with our exhibition so so november 1st was actually a uh, sikh genocide remembrance day but uh, we also had elections this year so we want to make sure uh, everybody uh, was busy enough and it's a busy time of year overall and on november 11th uh, there was a veterans day so we are putting up this event today november 19th uh, as a exhibition uh, as well as a presentation event uh, but the day we are commemorating is november 1st sikh genocide remembrance day So it is very important that we go back in history and uh, what happens to six 
and uh, different timelines where Sikhs have experienced these kind of things or injustices. The three important years that come to my knowledge is 1849. So we all know uh, Kingdom of Punjab uh, existed till 1849 uh, and Sikhs had their own Kingdom of Punjab, a free country where they were free to exercise their faith where actually everybody was given respect and uh, even in our Sikh art gallery we have a portrait of uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh and Hari Singh Nalwa and uh, the portrait of one of the cabinet meeting that was happening uh, during that time and you can see there is a, a not just Sikh representation even though it was a, a Sikh leadership was uh, uh, basically running the country but there was minority representation, there was Hindu representation, there were French generals, there were Muslim people in the cabinet. So it was a really good time for the Punjab itself, where every faith was given respect and everybody was given representation as well. But after 1849, British uh, rule came into the play and uh, Britishers ruled the region of that South Asia known as Kingdom of Punjab, also known as Sarkare Khalsa, but Punjab was the name of that uh, country at that time. So till 1947, Britishers ruled that area and Punjab was the last uh, area in South Asia which was conquered by Britishers after they conquered rest of the so-called India at that time. But in 1947, uh, there was a lot of displacement that happened for Sikh community or the people of Sikh nation. Because Punjab right now actually has been divided and further divided, which I will go a little bit more into that. But in 1947, when uh, Britishers wanted to do a transfer of power, and just want to give freedom to that region and go back to Britain, they called three communities, Sikhs, Muslim, and Hindus, because those were the three prominent communities at that time uh, in that region. And they wanted to ask them how you want to divide your regions. So Muslim community did get Pakistan, Hindu community got India. Sikh community just in a good faith and uh, with our ties to uh, the whole region itself, uh, they really didn't believe in at that time seems like it for making their own nation because they thought, you know, we have done enough for both the communities and we are sure we will be getting the respect and the freedom that we deserve. While Sikhs were the uh, people, more than 80% people who died for the freedom of India, which we so called India. So, but uh, in 1947, Punjab, Sikh homeland was divided into two parts. One half is still in Pakistan side and other half is on India side. And then in 1966, Punjab was uh, further jerry and uh, on the basis of language. And it's very unfortunate when we hear our hear oral history or from the people who have seen that time. And it's very disturbing to us that uh, people were telling in Punjabi language that their language is Hindi, just so Punjab get further divided and further get smaller. So now there's a little bit of Punjab left and the sentiment of Sikh communities that it is occupied by India because Punjab being a, a country or even being a state don't have any rights. Uh, they don't even have right over their water. Water is the lifeline of Punjab. Punjab is the agricultural state. And uh, Punjab has no control over its own water, which is even against the international riparian right. So there were a lot of displacement that happened in 1947. So there were a lot of killings based upon religion that took place over 1 million uh, Sikh community members were displaced during that time from Pakistan side of Punjab to India side of Punjab. But uh, further, what happened in 1950 was another disgrace uh, 
that uh, Indian constitution till now date says Sikhs are part of Hinduism. So there is direct threat on the Sikh identity and the people who were representing the constitution at that time from Sikh nation, they said we will not sign this constitution and they did not sign that constitution. So we have, we as a Sikh nation have not adopted the Indian constitution at all just because it threats our identity. And it's amazing that a country like America in a census 2020 that happened, uh, they have acknowledged uh, Sikhs as a separate ethnicity. And uh, so it's a kind of very unfortunate that uh, Sikhs gave so much sacrifice for that region and they are not given respect in that region, but uh, they came to America like 130 years ago and they are given more respect and uh, their identity has been acknowledged. There are various historical days have been acknowledged by these governments. So I think uh, there's a lot of work that uh, India needs to do on their end to make sure if they want to keep Sikhs with them. Uh, but uh, I'll go further along with my presentation. 1984, that's another historical year. And that's why we are here today of 1984. So in June of 1984, first of all, I would like to know that uh, there were a lot of sentiment built in the Sikh community. It's a long time from 1947 to 1984 when you're telling government to do something about uh, giving you equal rights, giving you the sovereignty that was promised to the Sikhs in 1947, but nothing happened. Uh, Sikhs were being treated as a second class citizen. And in 1984, when the civil rights movement was on the peak, uh, India tried to crush that movement by attacking over 37 Gurdwaras, which are places of prayer, including the Sikh spiritual center, Darbar Sahib, which is commonly known as Golden Temple, and Sikh political center, Akal Takhat, where all the decision making is made for the Sikh nation. So that was uh, one of the uh, historical event and uh, month of June has been recognized in Connecticut as a Sikh Memorial Month as well. So as you see my title, Sikh Nation History, and I divided that into three years, just so you have a little knowledge that how Punjab was a separate country. And it, even the title explains Sikh Nation journey from Kingdom of Punjab to genocide and slavery. So we'll go further along. So 1984 has been divided into two parts because there were two historical events on Sikh community that happened. First of all, June, as I said, uh, Sikh Vatican Darbar Sahib was attacked and over 37 other Gurdwaras to crush the movement of civil rights, which was actually led by Sant Jarnail Singh Khalsa Pindramale at that time. Uh, just like there's Martin Luther King, there's uh, Malcolm X, there's uh, many other leaders of the world, uh, Nelson Mandela. For Sikh nation, uh, they have given the respect to Sant Jarnail Singh Khalsa Pindramale in the same way. Then in November 1984, so after the attack on uh, uh, Sikh spiritual center in June, there were a lot of sentiment built in the community. And of course, uh, I cannot uh, uh, really applaud the efforts, uh, but uh, if you will take the community to that edge, then the community will always retaliate in the way which might not be acceptable, but when there's no other way left, even the United Nations charters tell that uh, you have right to defend yourself with the armed struggle. But before armed struggle even started, uh, when India rejected all the peaceful protests, on October 31st, the Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was uh, given, I will say, Justice was served to the Sikh community and Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was uh, summoned for her crimes and uh, two gunmen of uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi shot her just because they wanted to take uh, revenge of all the killings of that innocent 
men, women, and uh, children that happened in June 1984. But what happened next is another disgrace to India because that was someone's personal action that he took even though in the Sikh nation they have been given at most respect and they are treated as martyr because otherwise the killing of Sikhs was not stopping even after the June attack. So we, are, we as a Sikh nation of course uh, we are not happy about what happened but at the same time I think uh, Sheed Pai Beyant Singh, Sheed Pai Satwan Singh, Sheed Pai Kher Singh. They are treated as heroes of Sikh nation because they stopped the killing of Sikhs. That was, that was still going on. Uh, but what happened after that was a disgrace because uh, Indian politicians and their congressmen and their councillors basically said, now we have a reason to kill the Sikh community further. And uh, after that, for over four days, the killings of Sikh happened in the streets of New Delhi. They were burned alive. They were, mob was given actually the voter list. Uh, and we all know it's not, it wasn't accessible. So it was pre-planned that they know which Sikh household is. Uh, they burned uh, shops of Sikh community they burned cars of Sikh community, they burned Sikhs alive and even anybody who even had uh, any article of faith including the Kara was not spared and was burned and women were raped at that time and uh, this was done by the government and that is the reason we don't call it riots because India tried to tell the world it was riots that it was a communal violence between two communities and government has nothing to do with it. But it's totally wrong. Government was fully responsible and government was behind this killing of Sikh community. And over 30,000 Sikhs were killed during that time. And even after that, killing didn't stop. Uh, but a lot of Sikhs, including my own family, we moved from New Delhi to Punjab and Punjab was still uh, ha having a more population of Sikh community. So a lot of people thought, you know, we are maybe safer in the Punjab than in India or in any p other parts of India. Uh, so what our efforts are, we are trying to bring history to the right narrative. And we are thankful to all the people who listen to us and understand the pain of Sikh community. Because even though nothing much we can do at this point, uh, but it does give closure to those Sikh community members who have seen all this with their eyes and they have not served any kind of justice. So when it comes to aftermath of genocide, of course, uh, there are many tribal nations that live in Connecticut and in America who have seen this kind of atroc atrocities and it takes a generations to come out of that trauma. But Sikh community, I think, reacted in a very well, very well-mannered uh, way because of the concepts of Sikhism that we need to respect everyone. We need to respect all the faith communities. Uh, we need to respect diversity. But what happened is there were a lot of uh, displacement after 1984 genocide and a lot of migration that happened to countries like US, Canada, America. And the proof is that these governments understand what happened to us because they have given our people asylum. So they know there was a, uh, atrocities that happened on Sikh community in India by the government. And it's not safe for them to go back. So they were given asylums. Even though I still feel there is a lack of advocacy and just like uh, recently Armenian genocide was recognized at federal level, Sikh leadership should also try and contact their uh, members of Congress and uh, U.S. Senate to recognize those killings as a 1984 Sikh genocide. So aftermath is, till now, India failed 
and they deny the acknowledgement of pain of Sikh community and instead of calling it uh, genocide they still say it was riots even though it's uh, pretty ironic that uh, New Delhi legislation have recognized that as a Sikh genocide and there is a Sikh genocide memorial in New Delhi as well uh, so but when I compare it to foreign country, my experience is that Indian consulates and Indian diplomats and Indian media still call it riots instead of genocide just because they want to show the Sikh community that they are slaves in India. No effort of rec uh, reconciliation by India. So, and no justice. Justice can only lead to reconciliation. But India has always avoided to give punishment to the politicians or the people who were behind the killings of Sikh in 1984. And they have done many inquiries and inquiries keep on happening and happening and delayed. It's the poor judiciary that uh, India has that no decision has been made. And uh, some people have died on their natural death, but some people are still enjoying the political power who were behind the Sikh genocide. So they have been given impunities, all those politicians who drive the killing of Sikh nation. And some of the pictures while uh, in uh, countries like America, Canada, UK, where Sikhs have right to protest in a peaceful manner, they have raised awareness about these things every year. And those efforts are increasing day by day. But this is the picture of, uh, from the Sikh Genocide Memorial, which is in New Delhi. So after something bad as genocide or holocaust that happens anywhere in the world, what is the justice of this? And international communities also need to come into light. Uh, but in 1986, on April 29th, 1986, there was a resolution passed at the Sikh political center, Akal Takat Sahib. And the way Sikh democracy happened, I think we have a better kind of democracy because we have a collective decision making when there is any crucial decisions that needs to be made. The process is known as Sarbat Khalsa. And you all might know that uh, Sarbat Khalsa was also recognized by Connecticut General Assembly that uh, it's a collective uh, gathering of Sikh nation that happened on April 29th, 1986. And it was a peaceful gathering in which uh, Sikh nation decided, hey, uh, we no longer wish to be part of Indian Union. And there is nothing wrong with it because uh, they have denied our rights to us. Uh, they have uh, killed our community. They have attacked our places of worship. Uh, they have committed our genocide. They are still treating us as a second class citizen. And we just no longer wish to be part of this Indian Union. We just want our own separate country, which we had till 1849. And that was the resolution which was passed among over 500,000 Sikhs that gathered at that time in 1986, after 1984 Sikh genocide. And in the resolution, if you read, uh, they have called the other world countries to be on their side, to help us uh, get this freedom. Unfortunately, India suppressed them again, and they sent police to the uh, Darbar Sahib again and arrested a lot of folks and uh, with the fear technique which they are still implementing even their diplomats try to implement in countries like America and Canada the fear tactic uh, and uh, you know they try to crush the movement one more time but uh, there was a lot of resistance that happened after 1984 after 1986 this resolution that uh, what else we can do in a peaceful manner the answer was nothing 
if you want to protect your lives, if you want to protect your kids, if you want to protect your family, there's no other way left. And there was an armed struggle, which was, I, I believe it's under United Nations Charter, uh, that if there's nothing else left, then everybody has right to protect themselves. Even in America, we have Second Amendment, and there are reasons for it, and I respect Second Amendment. So, resistant movement happened till 1995, which was again uh, crushed by the Indian government, by infiltration, by creating false narrative, by making Sikhs fight with other Sikhs and forgetting about what their real goals are, which they are even doing it right now. And the infiltration is at uh, such a level that even our places of prayer, they have been infiltrated by Indian agents as well. And uh, there was a uh, news other day that I was reading that in Germany they have actually jailed some Indian spies who looked like Sikhs and they were just keeping tabs on Sikh activities. So, they're, they're, and we are sure what we have experienced in Norwich and in Connecticut, there are Indian spies in Connecticut as well, but uh, we are not doing anything wrong. We are doing everything under democracy. And I think we have a right to say what we have to say. And uh, they should not interfere in Sikh business. And uh, they should not uh, infiltrate or try to even try to tell our uh, Connecticut senators and our secretary of the state that uh, we need to change our Connecticut uh, General Assembly citation processes. Uh, no, we don't want any interference from any foreign country in our country, US. So I want to thank all the state community member who advocated and represented themselves very well. And it is important because, uh, let's be frank, our, our representatives don't know who we are. They don't even know where we're from, what our history is all about, what happened to us. So until and unless we educate them through these kinds of educational efforts, they just don't know. They only know one side of the story. And of course, we don't have our own country, so it's very hard for us to make our narrative. We don't have those uh, 700 uh, something uh, channels that speak what the Indian government wanted them to speak. We are a small minority community. We are 2% of the Indian population. And still, at this time, we are getting threats from uh, some of the leaders in India that Sikhs are only 2%. We should crush them. And there's no action being taken on those uh, people. So this tells you uh, that the solution for Sikh nation for survival is only and only sovereignty, which I will come in the next slide. So that's a very important question. A lot of my friends ask me who even know what our history is and they were like, so what you guys up to now and uh, what do you think uh, uh, will happen to Punjab? So Sikhs are peaceful people. We have always remained peaceful. There has been no violence that has been initiated by the Sikh community. And if there has been any retaliation, I think that's everyone's right to defend themselves. And this is what we have been taught, and there's nothing wrong with it. What Sikh community is doing now, even though we already had our consensus building in 1986, after 1984 Sikh genocide, that we no longer wish to be part of Indian Union, we are trying to do referendum and do some more uh, paperwork, and uh, it will help us to make our case in international courts and while almost 20% over, over 20% Sikhs now live in diaspora, so we have started from all these countries like Canada, UK, America, to make a consensus building through proper channels, through referendum, that would you like uh, Punjab to be part of India or not? Uh, and you can do that on ballot by yes or no. And uh, there's a Sikh advocacy group, uh, Sikhs for Justice, who is uh, doing this campaign, which I think is a very good way to tell the world what our consensus building tells us. 
uh, and I think it's a right democratic way and uh, every country is respecting that except for the fact India is not allowing that referendum to take place in India. Uh, but again, I think that's again a question for broader world leaders. Uh, are we still going to maintain our relationship with India? Uh, and we still going to keep uh, them as our allies or with the time we need to change our foreign policies so we can deal with the countries that respect democracy and minorities. So there has been advocacy to recognize six genocide. Uh, Connecticut has recognized that. Other uh, states in America like California, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, there has been effort made uh, through different resolutions as well. Uh, then uh, creation of World Sikh Parliament is one of the step. Another is uh, there has been awareness efforts in Punjab on how India is using Punjab as their colony and how uh, Sikh culture, Punjabi language and Sikh faith has been suppressed in even Punjab. So there's a lot of ground level work which is happening and as I told you Punjab has no control over its own water which is I think an issue not just for Sikh community but for other communities that live in Punjab because they also get affected if they don't have a clean drinking water. So of course, uh, uh, the justice, as I tell, is the uh, only sovereignty left. But uh, India is not happy about uh, Sikh sovereignty and when we talk about Sikh sovereignty in uh, platforms, uh, like I recently met uh, Prime Minister Albin Kurti, who is uh, Prime Minister of Kosovo. And I was like, and he was actually amazed to see us that uh, there are Sikh representatives who are here in the room. And uh, because of course, India don't recognize sovereignty of uh, Kosovo as they are aligned with Serbia and Russian Federation. But our members, uh, when we met him, uh, we were like, hey, at this point, of course, we don't have our, our own sovereign nation, but we understand what you had to go through get that sovereignty and to maintain that sovereignty and we respect you for that and we recognize your sovereignty. Uh, so I think uh, even a few days back there was a, a meeting of Sikh uh, community members of World Sikh Parliament with the Ukrainian member parliaments. So I think there's a lot of effort going on uh, at root level and there's a lot of awareness which is uh, helping. So sooner or later you know, all these uh, seeds will help us to build our narrative. Uh, but uh, of course, India is not happy about it. And even in countries like America, they try to suppress us just because they have foreign policies and they have diplomatic immunities. Uh, but uh, I think at this point, a lot of people understand, uh, especially after that farming protest, a lot of folks uh, get to know what the real face of India is and what kind of democracy India follows. But uh, they are still defaming Sikhs and legitimate Sikh struggle. They try to create fear and discomfort among the elected officials of uh, these foreign countries as well, not to deal with Sikh community. And uh, of course their interference does not stop here. They use a uh, threat calls and there are a lot of uh, things and techniques that they have but uh, Sikh nation will continue its effort of uh, getting justice, getting their sovereignty, uh, making sure everybody in the Sikh homeland Punjab has room, making sure we follow secularism in state of Punjab whenever it becomes sovereign nation. And this is the citation which was recently given to recognize Sikh sovereignty. So solution or justice? So what is solution? And what is justice? Uh, example of uh, US, uh, there was genocide committed, but uh, over 500 tribal nations have been recognized by the US. Uh, we have two sovereign nations living in Connecticut and helping to build Connecticut. 
but when it comes to solution of genocide, I think the only solution left is uh, we need to give those people breathing room. We need to give people flexibility to make their own decisions. We need to give them their sovereignty so they can do what's right for them. And I think the solution, which uh, at some point I think how we get to this situation. So six never happily got to come to this conclusion that there is no other option left. They tried each and everything. But at this point, I think only solution left for six and for the Punjab to protect its natural resources and to protect that culture and to protect that humbleness. The only solution is creation of uh, independent state Punjab, which is also known as Khalistan. But uh, the way India portray Khalistan in a very negative way and always uh, try to align Khalistan with terrorism when Khalistan means land of pure. It's a land where everybody is given respect. And we have proven that till 1849 when Punjab was led by the Sikh Empire. So justice delayed is justice denied. We all know that. And uh, the only request Sikh nation have at this point to all the world nations you guys need to recognize who we are and how helpful, keep, hel helpful we can be to this world. Uh, whenever there's any natural calamities, despite of this community, very small micro uh, minority community, they go everywhere. They went to Ukraine, they went to Haiti, they go everywhere and I'm very proud of my Sikh community and members of Sikh nation. Uh, just because all the humanitarian work that they do uh, for every one. But uh, creating that buffer state, Punjab, between the India, Pakistan, China, which are all nuclear powers, that is the only way to protect the indigenous people of Punjab, to protect the culture of that region, and world should support that. And Punjab, I know, like we even, we had Kingdom of Punjab till 1849. We had very nice relationship with all the countries of the world. And I think we can uh, show that again. So this is a conclusion of my presentation. Six want peace. We are peace lovers. Justice bring peace, which has been denied to six. And justice for Sikh nation at this point is sovereignty. And we will fight for our sovereignty till last moment of our breath because that sovereignty we are not asking just for ourselves. That sovereignty is for the whole region and for the whole world, for the well being of the world. Because the mission that Sikhs have is aligned with protecting all the humans on the world. So if we have our own sovereignty, if we can protect our culture, we can protect our faith, protect our language, we can do a lot better for everyone in this world. And at the end, I would like to thank State of Connecticut for recognizing November 1st as a Sikh Genocide Remembrance Day. These are some of the pictures of uh, various events which have been done at State Capitol of Connecticut or at uh, City Hall and we will also like to thank State of Connecticut for recognizing uh, April 29th as a Sikh Declaration of Independence Day which is another important historical day for Sikh Nation and thank you very much for all being here and I hope you enjoy the good food here and uh, enjoy the exhibition and uh, we will be happy to give you a tour of a Sikh art gallery as well. We have a lot of volunteers here today. And uh, it's just important to know who our neighbors are. And again, thank you for all being here. And thank you to all the listeners 
uh, who are listening in different parts of the world. And I really want to thank all the volunteers who are working everywhere in this world and trying to raise education. But uh, I must remind you, our fights are political and the solution of Punjab gonna be through politics. Even though faith plays a very important role, uh, but uh, all the folks who live outside the boundaries of Punjab, they also have a big mission. We need to raise this uh, political awareness and what state of Connecticut has done, we must make sure these things trickle down to federal level in US and other countries as well. So you have your own parallel narrative and you can make them understand how it's important for the world peace that we create uh, Punjab into a sovereign state and uh, help the Sikh community do what they do even without having sovereignty for this world because we want to make sure everyone on this planet has freedom, has right to express themselves and at the same time we want to serve the community. So thank you very much. Wahe Guruji Ka Khalsa, Wahe Guruji Ki